Welcome back. Well, you know, after one very cold winter that we've had here in central New Hampshire, it's starting to, it's starting to finally warm up. Um, today was supposed to be up into the uh, low 50s somewhere. I don't know. It, it seems like it's still colder because we get so much snow on the ground that's radiating up. So, uh, you know, even though the ambient temperature of the air might be supposedly a little warmer, it doesn't feel that way. We've got a little bit of a breeze coming through here, too, on this hillside. But um, I wanted to get out and uh, do a little bit of filming. And I have a couple of special things I wanted to do. Um, I want to talk about a couple of very special Winchesters. And uh, also, I want to give you a view of what... Uh, our New Hampshire looks like from the air. I've got with me a drone here, a uh, Mavic uh, Air 2. And um, by the way, you know, before you write and and ask me if I've uh, if I've got the Part 107 authorization to do this, I'm a Part 107 licensed pilot. So uh, we can get on with that and show you what the sky looks like and show you what the surrounds look like before the snow goes away. Take off. The home point has been updated. Please check it on the map. Well, let's take her up a bit and uh, get a view. It's late in the afternoon, so we've got some good uh, contrast of shadows. Good time for filming. Hey, let's bring it on home. Go home. That's us right down there. Landing. See if I can pick it up in the sky.
Good landing. So, you might not think this is too special, but this is my 32 special. This is my uh, Winchester Model 94, uh, made 1953. Been around a while. It's in great condition. Uh, I'm going to just pop off a few shots of the steel target down there, so stand by. That's an 8 inch steel target, 50 yards. If I can save my breath here. Here now, I've got something that's very special to me. I just acquired this. It's a uh, 1985 issue, model 9422, and uh, it's a very special uh, Boy Scouts of America edition that was uh, brought out for the uh, anniversary at that time, 1910 to 1985. That's what this commemorates. It's got a beautiful nickel plated, uh, electrolysis nickel plated receiver and uh, barrel bands and it's also got a, you see this um, crescent butt plate, it's absolutely gorgeous. Let me bring it up a little closer so you can see and uh, it's all beautifully uh, engraved, etched and uh, with Boy Scout logos on it and seeing as I was a Boy Scout, it's kind of uh, it's kind of nice to have this. I can't express to you how fantastic this wood is. This wood is uh, absolutely unbelievable uh, quality. Very, very, uh, very, very high grade uh, walnut grain. The finish is spectacular and the, uh, the checkering, look at the checkering. I mean, this is sharp. So this will cut you so sharp. It's, it, oh, I shouldn't say that, but it's it's beautiful, and uh, it's got the uh, Florida Lee Boy Scouts emblem groove top on it. Bluing is beyond. Uh, this this is eb every bit as good as the uh, bluing they ever put on their finest uh, model 70 super grades. So let's take and it's a takedown model. I'm going to talk more about this gun back at the uh, back at the uh, house because the light is failing, but I want to uh, pop some shots off at those targets down there. I got some 22 targets that should ring really nicely. So let's see what happens. That's it. See you back at the house. Well, I'm glad to be back in the comfort of my gun room here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's way, way too late as far as I'm concerned to still have snow on the ground. We've still got six to, six to eight inches of snow and uh, single digits we're waking up to in the morning. And uh, that's, that's too cold for the middle of March. But um, I had fun, I had a lot of fun, and I want to have more of it out on grass instead of snow, though. 
Now, there's probably a lot of you who are interested in uh, the uh, drone that I was flying, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a, in a different segment. Um, this is a Mavic, DJI Mavic Air 2, uh, and uh, it, it's capable of taking very, very good footage. Lighting was getting difficult in the end of the day. The sun was starting to drop below the uh, cloud level and it was, uh, it was difficult to get good color. So I had to do a little bit of uh, post-filming uh, color uh, correction, but uh, during, the, during the day when the uh, lighting is, is uh, good, uh, this takes fabulous footage. So I'll be doing some uh, commercial uh, filming with this um, to help pay for it and uh, earn a little bit of a living. Uh, so that's what I got my that's what I got my FAA license for. It's not a difficult thing to get, but I, I'll, as I say, I'll get into that at a later date, different segment. I mainly want to talk about the uh, rifles that I was shooting. Nobody needs an introduction to the uh, venerable Model 94 Winchester, and this is a pre-64 version. Uh, this was uh, made in 1953, actually. I looked it up. This was made in 1951. Uh, I was uh, mistaken. I had another rifle that was uh, made in 1953, and I get them mixed up sometimes. But anyway, this is a great this is a great handling gun. Uh, and 32 Winchester Special. A lot of people are not that familiar with what the 30, 32 Special is. It's um this puppy right here. This is a this is a 32 Special. And uh, if it looks similar to a 3030. Uh, it, it should because uh, they share exactly the same case with just a different diameter neck, same shoulder angle, same uh, everything else is the same. It's based on the 3855 brass, which has been necked down. So the um, the 32 is it's, it's pre 32 caliber is pretty much eight millimeter. It's uh, very similar to eight millimeter. Um, this happens to be a uh, spear. 170 grain bullet. Uh, I was shooting outside. I was shooting 165 grain Hornady uh, with the uh, flex tip bullets, and those also do very, very well. Both, both as far as I'm concerned, these are these are both game getters. Uh, they have they have equal they have equal authority uh, on deer. Uh, I I, t I found in testing that the uh, the spear 170 grain uh, actually gives me a little bit better accuracy than the Hornady. The Hornady gives me a little bit better, you know, it, it has a little bit more streamlined profile, so therefore it has um, a better ballistic coefficient. But, you know, within within the operating range of the 32 Special, which is 125, 150 yards, uh, that's, you know, you, you're, pretty much, you're pretty much in that ballpark with this rifle, no matter what. So it's a moot point whether or not it's got a flex tip and can theoretically get out to it, you know, the, the, I don't buy that nonsense of 250 yard 3030s and, and 32 specials. It's just, uh, that's really pushing the envelope because this rifle itself is just not inclined to shoot that accurately. Uh, I don't want people writing to me and telling me how they get MOA out of a Model 30, you know, Model 94 and that sort of thing because it just doesn't happen. Uh, it, it just, it's just not, it's just not that type of gun. Um, these are well made. Uh, these these guns were this uh, Model 94 was introduced by John Browning. Uh, he basically, um, you know, he he took the uh, Winchester lever action uh, concept and he perfected it. You know, and the Model 92 has uh, you know got the that's got the uh, internal workings, slightly shorter receiver. Uh, it's got the inter internal workings that's matched up for. Uh, pistol cartridges like the uh, like the uh, 4440 and uh, even now the uh, 45 Colt for some people uh, they're interested in that cartridge for uh, cowboy shooting and stuff. But uh, this is the longer action, which is uh, enabled by having this uh, toggle link down here that drops down, and that geometry allows it to throw the bolt back. Uh, a lot farther, another inch and a half or so farther, without having uh, a longer, uh, a longer stroke of the lever. So these are very, very uh, 
meticulously designed. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts in here. Uh, you know, if you're trying, you look at the inside workings of a Model 94, and you say that the guy was more than clever. He he, uh, he was quite a he was quite an engineer. He, he used to dream this stuff up. I think in, you know on a napkin uh, and put it together. But this gun's pretty accurate. Uh, you know, this gun is capable of. Uh, on a good day, on a, on a very good day, uh, it'll it'll shoot maybe three, uh, three and a half inch groups with uh, good loads uh, at a hundred yards. But that's certainly that's certainly um, sufficient for uh, deer hunting in New England, where most shots, frankly, are taken at less than thirty yards or so. Uh, and hits with authority. That thirty-two special is uh, the bullet is just a little bit bigger than um, thirty caliber. And uh, because, because it's a 170 grain bullet, the same weight as a 30 30 170 grain bullet, it's a little bit shorter, so it doesn't have quite the same uh, ballistic coefficient and sectional density. It's a little bit shorter and squatter. Uh, but it makes up for it, you know, in practice, it makes up for it by its diameter. So, and it also has a little bit more energy uh, and has a little bit more velocity because of its uh, because of its additional speed. It gets out of the barrel about 100 feet per second faster or so out of the average rifle. Now downrange, the 3030 being more ballistically uh, efficient bullet will surpass will surpass it. Uh, but you know, for woodland shooting, uh, this has always been kind of a favorite for. Uh, for game getting in, in New England and many places where the brush is thick. Uh, some people just tend to favor it. I just like it because it's a, it's a fun gun to shoot and it's kind of a classic old cartridge. I like to, I, I kind of, you know, I, I like the underdog cartridges. If you've, if you've noticed, I like my 222 Remington. I like my 257 Roberts. I like the 32 Winchester Special. I like the 41 Magnum. I like all the cartridges that everybody else seems to turn their back on. That's just the way I am because I like to I like to show that they actually work and that they, you know, for those who are the naysayers who who like to go with the traditional stuff, that's great. But uh, I like to uh, I like to uh, take the oddball stuff and get cranked up and work. And it's just a lot of fun that way. So this rifle right here weighs six pounds seven and a half ounces without anything in it, without any ammo in it. And um, it's got a 20-inch barrel, tubular feed, and you can see this is the carbine. So this one here has the full-length uh, magazine, and uh, it's got the uh, semi-buckhorn sights. Got top ejection, and as I say, it's got that target link action. And uh, the trigger pull on this is pretty nice. The tr you know they used to put some nice triggers on these guns back in the day. Uh, this this trigger breaks at about uh, just about three and a quarter pound, very 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 crisp. Nice trigger. Uh, it's a beautiful field trigger, and that's the way they used to come from the factory in those days. So before the before the legal department started getting uh, sued for various nonsense, uh, some of the differences that you'll see in the uh, earlier the pre sixty four model Winchesters. You know, the quickest, the, there's a lot of quick ways to determine which one you're looking at, but the quickest way of all to look at, look for this screw. Pre-64 model Winchesters had this screw right here, which secured this cross pin, this cross bolt pin, uh, and post-64 Winchesters uh, that were made uh, at, from 1964 on did not have that. So that's, that's a very, very quick way of uh, telling immediately if you have a, a pre or, or post uh, 64. Quite a few design differences uh, were incorporated with the uh, post 64s. I don't want to go into that too much, uh, but you know they, they began using uh, less expensive metals uh, inside rather than steel. Uh, they, they started employing some uh, aluminum parts. The uh, receiver was the receiver was. Um, Lightened, uh, not not quite the same quality uh, forged steel um, as this is. Uh, a lot of a lot of design differences inside, which uh, largely made uh, made machining them a lot simpler uh, and easier to put together. So 
they they actually turn out to work very well. The, you know, despite all the grumbling and and it's not it's it's not as nice as it's not as nice uh, as in terms of engineering as the the uh, pre sixty fours. That's for sure. But uh, you know the 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 newer ones they they've all they've all proven that they can bring home the game. They can all bring home the deer the same way. So they they shoot they shoot pretty nicely. Um, but this one here has got that steel butt the steel butt plate. Um, they continued that until uh, they continued that. I'm not sure when they stopped. I think that was all the way up until the uh, transition to the uh, post sixty four models. So that's that. It's a uh, it's a side, you know, side loading port right here for the tubular feed. And as you can see, I was having a little bit of difficulty with those uh, Hornady Spire Point bullet. They're not as easy to feed. Uh, these, these, um, these old, these spear blunt tip bullets, and these are not that blunt tip. These, these actually are pretty, pretty good ballistic coefficient. Uh, they're blunt enough to uh, prevent, you know, chain reaction and chain detonation in the magazine tube, but these here uh, are actually very, very flat shooting for a, for a 32 special. And uh, they, they, with, with my, with my sight cranked only up to the second, the second step on my notch here, uh, I'm all the way up to 100 yards, so with no trouble at all without changing my point of impact. So that's that fine rifle. Uh, now, what about the uh, what about that beauty that I was shooting afterwards? This is my this is this is one honey of a gun. Oh, I love this. You know, if uh, you always ask yourself if, if you had if you had to pick just one gun to keep in your safe, you know, what would it be? That would be a hard that would be a hard question to answer, but. You know, 22s, uh, you know, you can, you can shoot 22s a lot more than you can shoot pretty much anything else. Um, it's just a friendly cartridge. So if I had to nail it down to the one cartridge that I would keep, it would probably be a 22. Um, and if I had to nail it down to which 22 to keep, it might be this one right here. This is just such a beautiful gun, such a swift uh, handling gun. This, I mean, this, this is just so... So smooth, the action is, is beyond, uh, beyond description. Uh, you, you have to handle it in order to understand how smooth that is. Um, it doesn't have that clunky feel that that drop down toggle link uh, gives. This is, a, this is genuinely a very, very smooth, slick action uh, right out of the box. Now, this gun, believe it or not, weighs only five ounces less than that 32, and um, it's got a it's got a 20 and a half inch barrel. Uh, you, know, you can pretty well see where the uh, five ounces uh, disappeared. The, uh, the receiver is a little bit shorter, uh, probably by that half inch, which means that they added it to the, uh, they added to the barrel too. Uh, but they handle virtually the same. The, um, the detailing on this is just superb. Let me bring it up a little bit closer so you can see. Um, this is a commemorative model. This is, this is the uh, Boy Scout commemorative. Now I received this gun in as new condition with the box intact, all the paperwork, the uh, original string tag, really wasn't a string, it's a, you know, it was one of those uh, bead, uh, those bead tags which once you, once you snap it you know that it's, it's undone. Uh, but this gun had never been fired before since it was built in 1985. Um, you know, at my age, I don't want people to tell me that I shouldn't fire this. <laughs> you know, I'm not buying green bananas at my age, and I'm not buying guns to look at. I'm buying guns to have fun and shoot. You know, this is this is the what this this is what this gun is for. This is for shooting, and I wanted to have something that I could uh, I could enjoy looking at as much as shooting. Um, the engraving on this is, uh, it's, I don't, it's probably, it's probably uh, some sort of machine engraving. It does not look like it's etched, but it could be, I'm not sure. It's, it actually, um, it actually is uh, brilliant, brilliantly done. I don't know if you could pick that up with the lighting here. 
but it's got it's got Boy Scout motto, Boy Scout logo. Uh, it's got a uh, lot of lot of detailing here. You know, it's got uh, knots, knots, and uh, bends. Uh, different different things here, detailing, and on the receiver here on this side, you can see there's also uh, scouting scenes. Uh, I see this one here has got. Uh, what am I looking at upside down? This side's got uh, somebody, people, a couple of kids on a canoe. There's a scout in the middle here, and there's a couple of hikers. You can see that. Uh, you probably see that better if I turn it to the light. By the way, I'm I splurged on some uh, regulation lighting here so that I have a, so I can produce a little bit more. A little more passable um, video, so that it's a little bit more easy to watch. But it's got um, it's got some fantastic detailing all throughout. The um, the date right here it shows uh, 1910 to uh, 1985 right here on this top tang, and uh, the uh, they hide the they hide the uh, manufacturer's warning uh, underneath the manufactured by U.S. Repeating Arms. It doesn't actually, it doesn't have that warning, Olin Corporation. Um, and this is an XTR version. So the XTRs had that sharp, uh, handsome checkering, uh, but it also has uh, upgraded wood. This, this, uh, this this particular species of wood, just walnut, is so, uh, so richly um, grained and uh, smooth. Very, I mean, the, the finish work that they did on this, you know, there's no, there's no indication that you're looking at uh, polyurethane or anything. And right here you can see there's a uh, nice crescent butt plate. <clears throat> they called this the French gray. Uh, it's, it's basically, it's a, you know, I was, I was at one time in my life uh, out of high school I was a uh, electroplater and I would say that this is electroless nickel that's what it looks like and electroless nickel is uh, widely used in the firearms industry it's very very durable um, it doesn't it doesn't tend to wear off it'll last forever um, but the barrel band again that's the same finish you know, on the front band um, everything about this rifle is just so nicely made uh, the uh, tubular, the tubular magazine tube inside is uh, is steel. Um, the gun was the gun was uh, brought out in 1972. Now, and its production ran until 2005. And it spans the era of uh, Winchester's. Uh, initial closing and being turned over to U.S. Repeating Arms. So it spans that history. Uh, it was made in various, uh, it was made in various forms, uh, different carbine and rifle versions, and uh, it was made in, in a few commemoratives, the Annie Oakley uh, commemorative version, which is highly prized. Um, this one here was also made in a gold-plated uh, version of this gun which was called the uh, Eagle Scout edition and I understand that that, that was only available to those uh, who were actually uh, Eagle Scouts. Um, the box that this came in, uh, I don't have it right handy to show you, but the box that this came in was uh, detailed with all kinds of artistry illustrations on the outside, very much like Norman Rockwell. And Norman Rockwell used to do the illustrations for Boys Life magazine back when I was a kid. So, uh, although Norman Rockwell was no longer doing illustrations for uh, anybody when this gun came out, I'm not sure if he had, I'm not sure whether he was alive back then or not. But, um, so that's, that's how this gun was uh, conceived. And like I showed you before, it's got the, it's got the Florida Lee on the uh, stock. It's just an exquisitely made gun and quite accurate. So let's talk about the history of the gun a little bit. In uh, 1964, uh, Winchester really uh, 
disappointed an awful lot of people by uh, downgrading the machine work on their uh, various firearms. <clears throat> they had discontinued the Model 12 shotgun, the Model 61 pump action rifle. Uh, they had they had uh, basically you know cheapened in many regards the uh, Model 94 Winchester, and uh, by that time they had discontinued the uh, Model 92. Um, the Model 70 had undergone some machine changes, though though they were not that big a deal, I suppose. Uh, they still they're still great rifles. Uh, they had eliminated the uh, control round feed and uh, had gone to a push feed system, which uh, enabled a lot a lot less uh, production time and machine work. And they were they, you know they were competing in those days. There weren't too many firearms companies in the United States. It was Savage, Winchester, Remington, and uh, Marlin, and that was about it, um, and Mossberg. But aside from that, you really didn't, but it was Winchester and Remington down the line. They were the, they were the two companies that were uh, battling it out constantly, head-to-head, -head, uh, in both cartridges. They were always trying to stay ahead of the game. And uh, Savage was, by that time, uh, really... You know, they were sagging in, in popularity and in sales because their Model 99 uh, flagship gun was basically, uh, it, the tooling has, start, has started to wear and, um, at the factory and uh, it, people were starting to lose interest in the Model 99. Uh, there were a number of reasons why Savage was starting to uh, sag and I'm glad to see that they're, they're back now on top and producing producing some of the best firearms again. But um, when Winchester and, and Remington were uh, in heated uh, competition, everything that, uh, everything that they could possibly do to, uh, you know, to, to help their sales uh, was being done and to help their, uh, their profit margins. But Winchester uh, had, by 1972, uh, just just a few years after the 64, uh, what a lot of people consider their, their demise, um, Winchester decided that they had to uh, reestablish their credibility. And uh, so they wanted to introduce a gun that would do that. And it was the Model 9422 that um, they used to uh, reestablish their credibility in terms of uh, gun making. And uh, so they put all, all stops were pulled. Um, CNC machining was just starting to come in. Computer, computer control uh, machining was just starting to uh, come about. And um, it was first employed with this uh, gun. And uh, so they could take advantage of some cost-cutting practices while still producing a, a, a solid steel receiver with solid steel parts. Uh, everything about this gun is precision. I mean, it, it operates like a Swiss watch. And, um, and it's, it's uh, the, uh, the, the, the lock work inside is just is fabulous. I'll take this apart on the bench sometime uh, when I get my camera set up over there. And we can, we can go inside and, and uh, take a look at all the uh, workings. Um, but this is this is such a such a grandly uh, made gun. Now, the story goes, the story goes that um, the gun was designed uh, outwardly to be like a Model 94, and that you can see it is. Uh, you know, it has some certainly it has side ejection here rather than top ejection, and it's got a groove uh, top. You know, I mean, I. I've, I've had my I've had my cataracts uh, removed, and now I've got I've got lenses in there, so I'm back to 2020 vision. Probably not quite as uh, probably not quite as acute as when I was uh, a kid. Uh, I had I had a lot better than 2020 vision back you know back in the in my 20s and 30s, but uh, it's back to where I can shoot uh, open sights, and I don't have any problem shooting open sights uh, with with good lighting. Um, you know, for me, the idea of putting a scope on a, on a lever-action rifle is just, 
say, I don't know, it's like putting a meatball on a violin. It just doesn't look right. Um, there's, there's just, there's just something about, uh, there's just something about these guns, the way they, the way they hang in your hand. I always call it a luggage handle. You can't do that with a scope strapped to the top of it. You know, it becomes, it becomes cumbersome. That's not what this gun was for. And now I understand that pe some people need to have a scope because they can't, they can't see very uh, well without a scope, and the scope is an aid to that. But you know, a scope does not make a gun more accurate. Let me repeat that. A scope does not make a gun more accurate. It enables higher accuracy because it can allow you to see more clearly. That's the only thing it can do. It will not make the gun more accurate. A gun which shoots MOA is not going to shoot half MOA because it has a scope on it. It's not going to change the accuracy of the rifle. Um, as you can see, I, you know, I was shooting, I was shooting at 45 yards at a, there's my boy Benny. There he is. You come down to say hi? Huh? <laughs> yeah. He's, he's just, he's just, he's just doing very well these days. He's, he loves, he loves the snow. He likes to go out, he likes to go out and run around the snow. But I think he's not a heavy coated dog though. You know, Brittany's, they're from, uh, they're from France. So they don't have, they're, they're not, they're not like a spring of spaniels that can stay out in, uh, out in the Arctic all day long like a, like a husky. Uh, so now don't be stepping on that. Don't be stepping on that drone. There you go. <laughs> so, um, you got to go with mom, huh? Why don't you go take a ride with mom? Yeah, he's off. <laughs> so, uh, where was I? Yeah, I just, I just think that, uh, I just think that the idea of a, a lever action and open sights is just, you know, they're made for each other. Um, it certainly, it certainly is not a bad thing to put a peep sight on these things, uh, you know, but, but I just don't want to destroy the lines, the, the, the beautiful lines of this gun by doing that to either one of these Model 94s. Um, it's quick to handle. It's, it's very, it's, it's very easy, very, very well balanced, uh, and it's, nothing's faster. So, one of the neat things about the engineering of the Model 9422 is that it was designed from the beginning, rather than trying to retrofit the gun to Magnum cartridges uh, afterwards, uh, this gun was made from the get-go, uh, engineered to accommodate the uh, 22 uh, Winchester Magnum cartridge and also uh, it's, this, this gun was chambered in the 17 HMR, um, and that's how it was originally engineered. That basically it was retroed, it was it was retrofitted down to 22 short, long, and long rifle, which it handles interchangeably. Um, as you can see, this handle this handle drops down a little bit back from straight up and down. So. You know, by just by just swinging it a little bit farther, you, it, it'll it'll handle the longer cartridges. So this this gun was originally designed around the 22 Magnum cartridge, and then they then they designed it so it could be also uh, engineered for the uh, 22 short, long and long rifle that this one is. And you, that means you can shoot them interchangeably. I can fill this tube up interchangeably with all different sizes and it'll fire them just as handily. So. Um, there's a story that has been published uh, that the um, the gun's father was the Model 94, and but its mother was the uh, Model 61 Winchester pump. Well, you know I know the Winchester Model 61 pump. Um, I saw it in my Christmas video. Uh, this is this is the uh, that was. That was also a, a John Browning uh, design, and here's the uh, this this book here. If you ever if you ever want to get any of these books, you just uh, go to Cornell Publications, and they have this is an actual this is an actual bench book. This is uh, this was done by a gentleman by the name of A. A. Arnold. Um, 
he did hand drawings. This book is, I think it's almost 100 pages. Um, but he did hand drawings uh, over a course of a few years uh, covering the Model 94, uh, the Model 61, I think the Model 12 shotgun, quite a number of different firearms uh, that he, that he uh, sketched, uh, actual, actual takedown drawings on how to detail material. So this is a great book here. But you can go through this and you're not going to find too many similarities other than the, other than the uh, Tubular Magazine. Tubular Magazine, uh, the fact that it's got, you know, it's got a stock on it, <laughs> it's not, it's not a lot, and it's got a barrel. There aren't too many similarities in the action. So I don't know where, I don't know where that individual got his uh, information that, uh, that, the in, that the internal mechanism was designed around the Model 61 because uh, I don't see it. Uh, maybe, some, maybe some Winchester engineer of the day told him that or something, but uh, I, there's, just, there's just no way that uh, the two are uh, similar. Um, everything, about the, everything about the lock mechanism is, is completely different. The only thing that I would say is similar is that the bolt, the bolt locks into the top of the receiver the same way that the Model 61 does. That's about it. Uh, other than that, the uh, you know naturally this doesn't have action bars. This has got a toggle. This has got a toggle link that throws the bolt back and forth. Actually, very much like a 336 Marlin, uh, very similar to that. Um, and uh, the hammer here is exposed, where the Model 61 is an internal hammer, which is mounted uh, on the it's mounted on the lower the lower portion of the uh, receiver. Um, but this is a takedown gun. Now, when I say takedown, this doesn't have a thumb screw. This has the this has a uh, screw here, which is designed for a U.S. nickel. Period. Don't ever use a screwdriver on these. Don't use a quarter. Don't use a penny. Use a U.S. nickel. If you you know, that's what that screw was designed for. And you do not need to you don't need to wrench it down tight. Uh, this this gun is not going to come apart in your hands. You just you screw it down with a U.S. nickel until it comes to a stop, and that's it. Leave it alone. Uh, if you use if you use anything else, you're going to botch up that screw, and you're going to really ruin the design of that gun. It's it's going to really make a mess of it. So that's what it was designed for. Um, it comes down very nicely, very easily. So um, what else can I say about this gun? It was uh, produced. In many different uh, in many different forms, uh, both with and without checkering, as I said, most of them did not have steel crescent butt plates. I think this may have been. I'm not sure if the uh, Annie Oakley version did, uh, but that's kind of unique to this gun. I I love it. Um, it's uh, it just gives it a lot of class. But um, it was made in a tribute version uh, in its last year, um, and and those are highly valued. All of these guns now are uh, quite highly valued. Um, they're, they're one of the most desirable guns uh, on the market, on the used market. They're no longer produced. They were taken off production uh, after 2005. And um, so they had a good run, 33 years, from 1972 to uh, 1930 uh, to 2005. And, um, they were, they were, um, I would say they were quite expensive. Uh, it, it's a gun which people didn't buy for their kids. They bought it for themselves and then they left, they left it for their kids, you know, in their will. Um, it was a little bit, it, it was quite expensive. Uh, when this gun first came out, it was, it was selling for about $50 more than you could buy a Model 70 uh, Winchester. Uh, bolt action for it. So that was a little bit rich. That was a little bit rich for uh, most people. Um, I think when this came out in 1972, it was running about $179, which was an awful lot of money for a 22 in those days. Um, you know, you could still buy you could still buy a Model 582 and a Remington and things like that for you know for $60, uh, and so. This was the sort of this was the sort of pricing that was mostly out of people's reach, um, but you know, 
a lot of men bought it uh, for themselves, uh, and some I'm sure some women bought it for themselves. But it was something that it was something of a higher grade 22 than most people wanted to just give to their kids. So as I say, uh, those those who have had them in the family are probably going to tell me uh, in large part that their grandfather left it to them or their uncle or their father or something, but it was not something that they bought for a kid in those days. It was, it was, usually, it was usually something that people bought as an adult rifle and they left it behind. So, um, you know, you'll pay dearly for these. Uh, most, of these most of these guns now will run, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll pick up uh, a thousand dollars uh, it, it for for one in good in good condition uh, without any trouble whatsoever and beyond um, this gun here right now um, you know the, the boy scout unfortunately the boy scout name has uh, been soiled in in recent years uh, I'm, I'm so glad that I didn't have any of that in my uh, in my upbringing I had I had just fantastic guys that uh, you know taught us uh, scouting and uh, you know they were they were our neighborhood fathers. They they were fantastic guys. I mean they, they taught us they taught us the stuff that they learned uh, growing up and in, in, uh, when they were kids in, in scouting and some of the things that they taught us that they they brought home from World War II. Uh, there were a lot of there were a lot of um, great stories that uh, we got in the uh, in our scouting. It was a good up it was a it was a good upbringing. So I to to. To me, this this is a very this is a very special gun. I, I just I enjoy looking at it. I enjoy shooting it. I would enjoy shooting this uh, if it was a if it was a blue gun. But you know, I, I, I very much like the aesthetics of you know how a gun looks. That's I, I'm very much that way. So it's a terrific uh, peach of a gun to me. Um, I think that I think that uh, it's it's probably it's probably a gun that everybody should at least take a look at. Uh, though they are expensive, uh, I think I think that they're worth it. They're going to continue to go up in price as time goes on. I can remember when people were looking at these things and they were saying, "Gee, I'm just not going to pay three hundred and fifty dollars, four hundred dollars for a, for a used uh, twenty-two. Well, now those now those three hundred and fifty and four hundred dollar guns are getting you know eleven, twelve hundred dollars." in, in uh, excellent condition. So um, they hold their value very well and they're not making them anymore. And as the story goes, you know, the ones that you see are the only ones left. So uh, if you have an occasion to, uh, if, you like, if you like lever actions, uh, it's a good gun to take a look at. I suppose I should, I should say something about this gun compared to the uh, Model 39A uh, Marlin. I did a I did a breakdown of the model 39A Marlin. I don't have that rifle anymore. Um, they're fantastic guns, highly highly engineered, uh, beautifully made. Um, my personal preference goes to the 94, uh, simply simply because I just I it's just my own aesthetics goes to that. Uh, that's that's where my antennas go up. Uh, I tend I tend to like just the handling of it. It it's it's a little bit um, you know there, there is the there is the um, 39A uh, with with the straight with the straight stock. Uh, they had a couple of versions like that, um, and uh, those are those are a little bit those are a little bit more like this. And also this one came with a pistol grip version, so you can get them you can get them both either way. Um, I guess this has got this has got more of that classic long streamlined receiver, uh, whereas the uh, Model 39A has a shorter coupled receiver. Um, they both take down uh, with with pretty much the same ease. Uh, this might be a little bit this might be a little bit easier in some ways to take down than the Model 39A. Uh, there is one little part in there you have to just watch for because you you know you don't want to lose it. But other than that. Um, I would say that uh, I, I would say that you know it's it's whichever one you're drawn to. Uh, they're both extremely accurate guns. They kind of um, 
These rifles are more accurate than their center fire counterparts. You know, these, these rifles don't seem to be bothered terribly by the fact that they have barrel bands and that they have a stock, a uh, four stock hanging out there binding up the barrel because this gun, uh, this, this gun is a, a capable of extremely fine accuracy. Uh, I would say, uh, the, the, with open sights, I've, you know, down here in my, in my indoor range at uh, 50 feet, I've shot uh, quite a number of half inch, you know, half inch groups with 10 shots. So uh, at 50 feet, you'd have to do the math, but uh, that, that certainly is, that's certainly a bullseye territory uh, up to 100 yards without any difficulty. Um, and that was when, that was when in rather dim light where I don't get a good sight acquisition, but you know, if you plopped a scope on here and you did some testing, uh, my dad had one of these. Uh, he had an XTR blued version, um, which went to my nephew, and um, that particular that particular gun was capable of uh, one and a half MOA. Uh, he put a scope on it to see how uh, how good it was, and it was one and a half MOA, which is extraordinary for a, a 22. Uh, and that was out of that was out of a carbine, the same as this. So I suppose that this may be able to shoot the same. Um, that means inch and a half, inch and a half at a hundred yards with uh, with good match grade ammo. So it's a delightful gun, very very well made. The Winchester never made a gun any better than this. None. I mean, no matter which gun it was that they made, they might be a different design, but they weren't made any better. This is, this is the top of the craft. Um, and I would say that uh, if, if you can get your hands on one, uh, to give it a try, give it a spin, go ahead and do so because I think once you do, you're going to be hooked. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell so you can uh, know when I'm launching another video. God bless.